Thank you. 
praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. God is good. Oh, Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God is incredibly good. Amen. We know that God knows everything. There's not one thing that we can hide from God. He knows everything. There's nothing that can be hid from Him. Amen. The amazing thing about the mercy and the love of God is that because He knows all things, he even knows what's going to happen before it does happen. Even in the life of disciples, and he knew that the day that he was going to be crucified and how he was going to be betrayed and who would do it and all these things. Yet when he knew all these things that was going to take place, it, the amazing thing is that Jesus did not try to stop it from happening. In other words, he didn't try to run away from it, but he faced it. For him to be willing to say, okay, I know I'm going to be betrayed, and Judas is going to do it. And he knew that afterwards he would be going to the garden and send me to make his prayers before he faced the ordeal of suffering and going through the hardships of everything. He knew when he went into the garden of Gethsemane and he asked him to watch and pray with me. And, and while he went there and began to pray, praying was in much agony and burdens. And you probably wonder to yourself, why would Jesus be agonizing and in burden while he's praying in the garden of Gethsemane? because he knew what he was about to face and in his heart he didn't really want to experience the suffering that he was going to experience. He knew that, that it was going to be very difficult and even when he was praying to his father if it's possible, take this thing out of my way and say, don't let me go through this if it's possible, but nevertheless not my will be done. It's the same thing when we're praying and seeking God and God's bringing to the crossroads in our lives and God is dealing with our hearts and minds and beginning to open our eyes to see where we are and where we need to lay down things in our lives that we sometimes are not always willing to do what God's will says. So we struggle within ourselves, especially when it comes to that if you're going to suffer or if things are going to go wrong or you're not going to have your way. You know, we always have the tendency to then begin to really fight against it, you know. And that's exactly at the time when this was happening, you know, Jesus then chose to to go to the fulfilling the will of God in his life, which also that meant that he had to suffer. Amen? Amen. And be willing to die. Now, I understand that Jesus made it possible that he would go through all this suffering for us. Amen? In order to save us. But then, when we're following Christ, the disciples came to Jesus one day, uh, asking if they can sit on his right hand or left hand on his throne and and he said well it's up to God who decides who's going to be on my right hand and left hand on a throne in heaven but it says then he asked the question but are you willing to drink the cup that I drink and what he was really referring to are you willing to lay down your life to the point that 
you're going to lay yourself down and be willing to surrender yourself 100% to me and drink of that cup that like he drank where he would end up giving up his life to, in order to have the life with Jesus Christ or the life with the living God. Amen. And that's the same question we have today as we're facing these final hours before the coming of the Lord. That's the question. Are we going to come to real church? Are we going to become that church that, that's going to go all the way with Jesus? Are we going to be the church that's going to surrender everything and lay it aside that we can put the will of God into our lives so we can enter into the glory of God? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We understand how Jesus laid down his life and he was willing to die. The question, have you, are you willing to come to the place that you, you're going to even die to the very existence of sin in your life so Christ can redeem you by the grace of God and set you free because he cannot set nobody free from anything unless we are willing to surrender and lay those things down. If there's issues, there's offenses, if there's unforgiveness, there's the resentment, even if it's just an ounce, just a little bitty, bitty little thing, he wants all of it. And that's where we, we have to realize that we have to humble ourselves. In humbling ourselves, we're willing to surrender those things. You know, you can be overwhelmed by discouragement. Did you ever stop and think that God wants you to humble and humble your discouragement and bring your discouragement, your hopelessness that you feel in your situation over yourself or in your circumstances? and lay it on the altar and say, God, here's an area that I need to surrender to you. And just like God had said to me, Jesus said, I'm going to do your will, not my will. And therefore, in doing the will of God, he went through the suffering. You know, he was betrayed. He was tortured. He was falsely accused. He was lied upon. And when he was going to all those things, knowing that you are in the right place, you are doing everything right, and they're blaming you and condemning you, that he was willing to not allow any of those things to have any effect on his mind and his thoughts, but he rather humbled himself and became willing to become the sacrifice for our sins in order to, through his death, dying on the cross, he would be, have the power to save us from this evil, wicked generation and corruption. And therefore he kept his heart pure and holy all the way to the place where he surrendered himself to Christ, to God and, and, and to the life of God. Just like we are going to surrender our life completely to Christ. Amen. Because you can never be free from something until you surrender it. Amen. You can never have the will of God being fulfilled in your life until you submit to the will of God. And each one of us needs to seek the face of God to see where is it your will in our lives this day? Where do I need to humble myself even today so I can lay these things down so I can enter into your faith? into your glory, into your love and your righteousness, so God can fill us and bless us. Amen. Hallelujah. How simple it is that what God wants to do with us. Hallelujah. How many understand what I'm saying? Amen. Hallelujah. We are at the crossroads in our lives. We're in the end times. God is about to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And what God is going to do is going to be supernatural. Amen. But before that supernatural manifestation that's going to come into our lives, we've got to remember that when He begins to pour that Spirit into us, it's a question of are we going to receive it when He pours it out? Are we going to humble and surrender ourselves to His life so He can then come alive inside of us? It's a question of what are we going to do? Amen. We have to draw the line in ourselves and say, 
which life are you going to live in? Are you going to live in your flesh or are you going to live in my spirit? Amen. Even though we have the flesh, we don't live after our flesh. Amen. And we got to deal with the carnal thoughts and imaginations and thoughts that are constantly warring against our mind, trying to bring us back into captivity to the bondage that was trying to choke the life of Christ in our lives, that's trying to stop the love of God flowing out of us and, and intercede and standing in a gap. Amen. You know, when you begin to pray and intercede and stand in the gap for this, for the, for this world and the people that are lost in this world, are we going to have the compassion and the love to lay down our life and begin to intercede in prayer to the point so that the Holy Spirit will anoint us to intercede and intervene on the behalf of this world, of your loved ones, your neighbors, in your, your cities, your leaders of our land. Are we willing to say, God, we are now standing in a gap and we are praying and, and, and standing in the grace of God and the offering of Jesus Christ and we lift up that offering of your blood and your body and as we petition the needs of this world that God, by the grace of God, you will deliver our nation from the captivity of darkness and sin and from the powers of darkness so that they might be saved. Amen. Hallelujah. That means that we cannot pray that kind of pray, prayer for them or for the wicked unless you have a compassion and a love that you don't want to see them being judged and condemned and cast into an everlasting darkness of hell and lose their soul for eternity. We must get the compassion of a love that's in our hearts like Jesus had, that he was willing to lay down his life. Do you understand when you're laying down your mind and your thoughts and your imaginations and what you think, things that should be done, we need to have the compassion of love to break the yokes of bondages, to lose the people from the captivity of darkness so God can come alive inside of us. Hallelujah. And in spite of what it appears to be, God is greater than the circumstances that we're facing. No matter what you're facing, you remember we have the power, we have authority to take authority over all the powers of the enemy. And we have the divine right to say, in the name of Jesus, get your hands off my family, get your hands off our city, get your hands off the people that are lost and, and blind. Deliver your people from the confusion and the lies that Satan is filtrating every heart and mind. And then submit to the very truth of God and say, Now God, quicken my mortal body and mortify the deeds of my flesh. And God, sanctify your life within me so that you can come alive in me. Hallelujah. And fill me with the Holy Ghost fire so you can lead me, you can guide me, you can live in me, and you can manifest yourself in the Holy Ghost in our lives. Hallelujah. We're in the last days and things are not going to get better, but God is getting ready to have the greatest move of God that this world has ever seen. But there is going to be a price that we have to pay the price of coming in total 100% surrender, submission to the life that raised Jesus from the dead so that that life will quicken your mortal body and release you from the captivity of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and the pride of life. Hallelujah. To have total freedom, total liberty that when the devil comes against you, he will not find anything in you for him to grab a hold of. Hallelujah. He cannot tempt you with every lie and deception and, and corruption and, and, and deception that's in the world. But you are going to be totally free to stand up against the vows of the devil and say, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That we're not walking by the flesh of man, but by the grace of God to faith in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. 
We're talking about getting ready for a move of God. It's going to be a battle. But our battle is not going to be with flesh and blood. Our battle is not going to be with people. Our battle is not trying to argue till we're blue in the face. We're trying to convince people to believe the truth. We are, we're going to get on our knees and we're going to intervene and stand in the gap. And we're going to bind the strong man and pull down the strongholds of Satan. So that God can release people from the captive of Satan's powers in their minds and hearts have taken captive according to their own personal will because they have allowed sin to come into their minds and hearts because the world doesn't know that they're lost. The world doesn't know that they're blind. The world doesn't know that they're going to hell because if you told them that they're going to hell they won't believe you. No. So we got to understand we are dealing with a spiritual battle and no man can come to the Father except the Spirit of God draws them. It's not theology that's going to save them. It's the grace of God. It's the faith of God. It's the power of the living God that can come into your life just like when God came into your life. If you can recall when the Lord saved you, you weren't looking for God. But God was looking for you. Amen. Amen. And when God came into your life, you didn't even know that what things you needed to change, but because you opened your heart and, and you were at the bottom of the barrel in your circumstances in your life and you were up to your neck to the point that you were willing to surrender your life to anything to help you out of the mess you're in, not even realizing that when you did that, the Holy Spirit came into your life, broke the yokes of bondages and sin and corruption, and took out that evil demonic spirit that had you bound in your mind, emotions and thoughts, and set you free. And there had to be only the grace of God. How in the world could God know that when you came to Him and when He met you that day in that service or whether He met you at your home or whether you were alone and, and right on the street, no matter where you were, all of a sudden this Holy Spirit made an encounter with you and changed your life. And when God did the changes in your life, you were never the same. Amen. Even though you didn't know nothing about God, but that it was after that, how can a man suddenly stop living in a life of darkness and then decide to want to serve God and go to church and hear the Word of God and go into a church where the anointing and the power of God is present to awaken His life within you? Now I realize Every one of us has a different journey to take to come into God's kingdom. And God takes through many avenues to get there. Hallelujah. But eventually we finally get to the place where we're supposed to be. Amen. And when you get to that place, you finally realize that some of the ways that you were going and, and seeking God in wasn't really God's ways. You're finally going to wake up and realize that really wasn't God's way. That wasn't God's way. And I said, now I have found the way, the truth, and the life. I have come into the life of Jesus Christ. His life is now inside me. He's been there for a long time. But now I am learning how to yield to Him. Allowing Him to live in me instead of me. By letting Him come alive to the Holy Ghost and by the power of love. Hallelujah. And willingly every day, just as you yield to God and begin to worship, you begin to yield to the Spirit of God and all of a sudden the Spirit of God is all of a sudden bringing this freedom and liberty in the place, in the areas of your heart and mind and all of a sudden you've got this joy and peace and the Holy Ghost inside your life because you're now His. Amen. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Even times when you wake up in the morning, you don't really feel like you're serving God. At times when you're going through the day and it seems like God is a million miles away. Hallelujah. But God has never left you. He's in your heart. We just need to wake it up with prayer. Hallelujah. We need to stop and start praising God and worshiping so you enter into that spirit or the spirit inside you awakens and comes alive inside of you. And all of a sudden you forget your circumstances and your problems that you're facing in this world. And all of a sudden God fills you with the peace and victory and joy in the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. What an incredible God, amen. You see, no matter how long you're serving God, you're always going to have this flesh that's giving you a hard time that cannot submit to the things of God. So, so just realize it's only normal for your flesh to want to serve God. Your flesh don't want to pray to God. Just remember that your flesh does not want to, to, to look at and read the Word of God. Amen. You've got to realize that you've got to come into that relationship and fellowship with God that only comes through the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And when you take that time to be in the Spirit and every day make it a point that you make an appointment to meet with, with God in that and have fellowship in the Holy Spirit, you begin to realize He go to work with you. He go, He's at home with you. He's in everything you say and do. He's coming alive in you. Now, people are not going to understand you because they think you're weird because you're not thinking like they're thinking. Obviously, they don't understand how come you don't, you don't desire the things of this world. Well, it's because you don't have any, any want for it. Amen. You have a, just a desire to serve Jesus. And, and the world doesn't bring you no peace. The world, this world system doesn't bring you answers and peace. You know, people are running after the lust of the eye, lust of the flesh and the pride of life, but none of those things interest you. Why? Because your spiritual man is more stronger inside you. And when you yield to that freedom and liberty, People say, well, you're a boring person. Well, no, you're not boring. Amen. Amen. You're just living in the life of Christ. And it's boring to the world. Because the world has to pump you and get you excited. They, they got to feed that, that fleshly man to satisfy. You've got to be entertained in the natural to be, to be happy when you get into the spirit, you don't need none of those things to entertain. You can be all by yourself sitting alone in, the, in your home, in your chair and reading the word of God and you feel at peace within you. Not because that you're being excited about anything, but, but God himself is coming alive within you. Yeah. Hallelujah. And you can, you can enjoy life, you know, you know, it's not like you have to have something to pump you up to keep you happy. You know, I'm going to look for something to make me feel I have fun. Listen, I, I have more fun being in the presence of God. I have more peace living in the Holy Ghost that I'm not looking for the things of this world to fill that void because God has filled the void with the love of God. Hallelujah. You know, when you start living in this relationship with God, you, you don't even have a hate in your heart or mind towards anybody. Even when people do you wrong and people mistreat you, you just, you know, you're just not being affected by that. You're just going to go on and serve God. Hallelujah. But sometimes if you're affected by that, you have to lay it down. You have to bring it to God and say, you know, I've been mistreated by somebody and I need to have that taken out of my heart because I don't want that to become a stumbling stone in my life where I would take offense to that. Amen. I'd rather have freedom. And so we forgive those who trespass against us. And no matter what they say to you, we forgive them. But that doesn't mean that we're going to lay our head down and go ahead and chop it off. 
if you know what I mean, you're not going to allow someone to purposely come in and, and beat you up in your emotions, in your mind, because they want to speak bad words to you to hurt your feelings. You have to be armed and you back off and say, I'm not here to argue with you. I'm not here to have a, a debate about what you feel or how you don't like me and all that stuff. And I'm not going to receive any of your negative words towards me that you're trying to hurt my feelings. Uh, in fact, I'll step back. Did you know that Jesus, when he went to Samaria and he cast out a demon out of this man that was possessed with a legion and the, and the demons that came out of this man went into 2,000 pigs and they ran violently into the lake and drowned and the whole city came out or the town came out and, and because this took place they were praying to Jesus that please don't come here can you imagine that they didn't want Jesus to be there. And you know what Jesus' response was? He wasn't fighting or arguing with them and trying to beat them over the head. He says, okay, I'm leaving. As you wish. You know, if you want me to leave, I'll leave. But he, he, he came back, not by himself. A few years later, he said, he sent Philip the evangelist into the same area. And then he had a big revival. But the man that was possessed with the demon power of hell that could not be could tame him remained in that place because he wanted to leave too. But Jesus said, no, 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 you stay here. You're going to be a light to these people. People are going to recognize that there's something different about you. You're not like the man that you used to be. So you are actually a light in the midst of darkness. When you get saved, the people around you will know that you're never the same. They will not be able to put their finger on you. I, it's amazing, when I got saved, I lost all my friends that I used to party with. Because now I wasn't partying no more, no, they didn't want to be my friend no more. Can you imagine? They really weren't my friends. They only wanted to get a high with me, that's about it. But now that I didn't do that, they didn't want nothing to do with me. And they didn't want to associate with me because light and darkness don't mix together. Amen. And that's just the way it is. You know, if, if somebody doesn't have the light of God in their life, they will not like you. So don't look for acceptance. Just thank them and say, God bless you, I'm praying for you. Amen. Understand that God is with you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So that man with the legion demons that was in Samaria, he was a witness there till finally God sent uh, the Philip the Evangelist there to preach to them because their hearts and minds had been prepared by this man that was delivered by his witness. And it got people to think about that they needed some help too in their lives. And so when evangelists, Philip the evangelist went there, they had a move of God. Yeah. yeah. You see, sometimes we think it should happen today, but it doesn't matter because if you're planted the seed, you have done your job. And, and then just go and plant some more someplace else. Jesus didn't stick around. Uh, where he was in, in Nazareth, he couldn't preach to them because they, they couldn't believe who he was. They couldn't believe he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And therefore, Jesus could not do anything with these kind of people. He couldn't heal them. He couldn't set them free. Why? Because all they could say is, well, you're Mary and Joseph's son, they never recognized the anointing and power that was in his life. Therefore, God's anointing could not minister to them. And so many people, it's kind of amazing when I go to the third world countries and nobody knows me. And that's good because they're not supposed to know me. 
Amen. And when I preach about Jesus and I talk about how Jesus came to heal to set the captives free, and then they respond by giving their life to Jesus, and then God heals them and sets them free. Their eyes are not on me, but their eyes are on Jesus. And, and then they begin to serve God with all their heart and mind. And you know, that's the way it is. And sometimes when people are in church, they have the tendency to keep their eyes on the preacher so much that they try to figure out the preacher and they try to find anything in the preacher's life that they make something to pick on. And when they find something they disagree on with you, then they try to justify that, that well, I'm not going to listen to this preacher because this preacher has this, this, and this, and that with his life that I don't agree with. Well, it has nothing to do with what's in my flesh. You may not like my flesh, but you're not supposed to let my flesh affect you to the point that you stop serving God. Amen. I'm not here to please you, and my flesh may not please you, and at times my flesh may will say things that I shouldn't say, hallelujah, but you, you need to realize when, when it's God speaking to me and when it's me speaking, know the difference. It's the same thing, you got to know about yourself. When God tells you things and when you just say things, we all love to have that. You know, we're human. Amen. We can, we can argue with God, did you know that? But you know what happens when you argue with God? You always lose the argument. <laughs> he always is right. He's never wrong. But he will be patient. He won't argue. He lets you figure it out, and then when you figure it out, and then you're right again. Hallelujah. I remember the time when God called me to come to Sudbury, and in my heart, in my mind, I was, I was thinking about what's coming to Sudbury, and, and uh, I was arguing with God because when God finally revealed to me that I'm coming to Sudbury, I said, go away. Mm -mm. No, not Sudbury. I go anywhere in the world to preach, but not Sudbury. Well, I argued for a few days and I lost the argument. God never said a word. I finally have to surrender. You're right. You want me to go there with God. Amen. Amen. It's been 35 years since I made a call of God. Amen. Believe me. It was the grace of God. They believe me. And I believe God brought me for 35 years here for one reason only. To conquer and to overcome all the things that takes place in Sudbury and what Satan does to preachers. Amen. I've gone through every trial and every test and every preacher's never been in Sudbury. I've experienced it all. But I sure have to do a lot of humbling since I experienced those things. I could have picked up my bags and left any time. But you know what? God will let me. No, no, you stay here. You die a little bit more. You lay down your life. You forgive more. You begin to walk no matter what crisis you face. I give you grace to overcome it. I will keep your heart pure and clean and holy in spite of whatever you go through in life. See, that's where people don't see it. They figure that if, if you're, when you're serving God, you're not going to have any trouble. You're serving God, there's, everything's going to be hunky-dory and everything is perfect and there's not going to be any problems. And, and you figure, well, there should be any problems in my home. Well, that's where the number one problem comes at. He says, your problem comes with those in your household, with your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your wives and daughters and sons, you know, because the opposition many times comes from your family. They're opposing you when it comes to serving God. But you've got to realize, by walking in the love of God, you will have the patience to endure, and as you're walking in the love of God, you will always walk in forgiveness and mercy. And you continue to forgive and then, then you end up yielding to the love that gives you the forbearance and the long-suffering 
and, and the patience to endure everything, knowing that one day, those people that you're loving and, and overcoming all these things in your life, that one day they will come to God and give their heart to Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, one of the hardest things is to love, especially your family members, when you know they're not serving God. It's easy to love those who love you, but love now the ones who are not serving God. It takes more love. Amen. That you have to be kind towards them. You have to be patient with them. You gotta. You have, you have a love that will believe for them, and you, your love that will endure them, and and you have a hope for them. And no matter what, you're just gonna trust God to work it all out. But if you try to work it out, it ain't gonna work Amen. because you'll be bucking your head against the wall. So God says, let me do it. Do it my way. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, God's not forcing anybody to go to church. You have to want to come. Amen. God's not forcing anybody to pay their tithes and offerings. He always gives the option, God, you will. Amen. And when you obey God in even tithes and offerings, God blesses you. Automatically. Hallelujah. God, God always provides for you when you bless God. He will supply your needs. Amen. Never fails. Hallelujah. And when He tells you to love people, that means you don't care what church they go to. Because somebody who doesn't come to your church it's not like this is it, these are the only people I'm going to love. No, you're going to love everybody. You're going to love the other church, you love the other pastors, even if they are speaking against you. You don't speak against them. Yeah, but that's a pretty hard thing to swallow because if you know someone's talking bad about you, the easy thing is to be tempted to talk bad about them because they're talking bad about you. That's not how it works. You've got to maintain your walk in love no matter what people say and do to you. Amen. Amen. I can remember when I was working in the mines and then some of the guys were cussing and swearing at me and called me all kinds of names. And after they do that, I said, thank you. Very nice words for you to say to me. Amen. <laughs> And they got really riled up and upset because they didn't get offended. I, I can recall even even some other people, you know, that didn't like me. So every chance they got, they tried to belittle me. Every chance they got, they were knocking me down. They were calling me names. Every chance they got, they were trying to tempt me to have beer and I wouldn't take it. And, and every all these things and, and they could not understand me why I wasn't getting offended and why I wasn't getting mad at them. I could smile at them and say, no, I'm not, that's not my life. And uh, they couldn't understand me. They didn't like me either. You could tell because they're like, the, you know, when the dog and the cat meets together or the cat all the all the hair stand up and the dog and piss at the dog. <laughs> and the dog is just a, you know, he's just smiling and wagging his tail. <laughs> not thinking that he's not up to harm the person or the dog or the cat, you know. You see, we gotta understand that we are being chosen by God to be a light in the midst of darkness. So shine your light. Don't ever hide your light that you're living in. Don't hide that grace that God you're coming in. Whenever you shine the light, just be who you are. You don't have to preach to them. You just have to shine the light. Just they you know your character, your nature, your behavior, and, and you say the things in a nice way. And of course, there's times that when we're speaking to people, 
Well, when we when they ask a direct question, we ask them, well, what do you think of this? Well, then you tell them the truth. Amen. Amen. I, I mean, I tell the truth, you know. Not that we're going to tell them off the truth. It's, you can use the truth as a, as a destructive weapon that's going to hurt people. Or you speak the truth in love. Amen. Because you need to tell them the truth because if, as long as they don't think they need to know that, you know how people say when you say something that the Bible says is true, they say that's your opinion. Well, that's not my opinion, that's God's word. Amen. I don't have an opinion about it. I just stick to the word of God. Amen. Amen. But no, no matter what, where you are, you've got to understand we're living in the days and, and the hour that people need to see the love of God. And where are they going to see the love of God? It's in you. Hallelujah. They see your behavior, they see your mercifulness, your kindness, because you're living in it. You can't legislate the love that you're walking in to say that you're going to live this way. They have to decide that they want to have the life you've got. And they got to realize the only way they can have that life that you've got, they got to give their heart to Jesus because if they're looking, thinking it's your personality, it's not your personality. It's the divine nature of God in you who makes you who you are. And those areas that you have conquered and overcome, you know how the devil is, he'll try to find a fault in you so he can accuse you, so he can try to justify himself, and then he can try to say, like I can remember when I was working in the mines and and, and so I finished up my work. I had nothing to do, so I was kind of standing around doing nothing. My shift boss came to me and said, what am I doing? I said, well, nothing. I've done everything that I could do. He said, but, I said, you're a Christian. I said, yes, I am. I said, well, you're supposed to be an example to everybody else around here. I said, you're right. He says, and I don't want you ever to stand in the round, even though I was just a service man. I don't want you to ever stand around doing nothing. You're always going to be doing something because then you show that you're a Christian. You're doing your job. So I said, okay. And they kind of, kind of like, I had to bite my tongue when he said that to me. <laughs> because my flesh wanted to say few things to him in opposition to what he just said. But I humbled myself and I said, okay, I thank God that this ship boss gave me correction, which I deserved, because he was right. And therefore God forgive me that I wasn't a good example. I said, but from now on, Lord, I'm going to make sure that I'll never stand around doing nothing. And so I end up being a service man when I had nothing to do. I would pick up all the garbage in the mine and bring it to the station every day. Until there was so much garbage coming to the station because they got to take it to the surface that the, the cage man could not get rid of the garbage in front of the station on the floor that we were at. And so what happened, as a result of that, um, the captain of the mine that, that worked on that level came down and chewed out the, the, the cage man and said, how come you're not getting rid of garbage? Just keep this garbage still here, nobody's moving it up. I said, well, I do take him out, but this crazy service man keeps bringing me some more garbage. So I can't get rid of it fast enough that way this guy brings garbage, he brings everything here. So so he then the captain came on the, 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 the upset with the ship boss and, and began to tell him like you gotta stop this this service man <laughs> for keep bringing garbage here because look at the mess he's making and he chew him out and so my my ship boss came to me and said, All right. I says, uh, 
from now on, stop bringing garbage to the things that, and, and go hide yourself someplace quick when you got nothing else to do. So, you see, if I would have had an argument to respond and argue with him about the whole thing, I would have had a problem, but because I submit to him as my boss and did what he expected me to do, and I overcome evil with good. Amen. He was just picking on me for being a believer. He was just trying to make me look like I was bad as a Christian. And it's a day that I went, I went to the school of ministry from the mines, uh, went down to Georgia for the school of ministry. And my, the captain was actually a Christian. That was in our boss, in our, our section of our mind. And he basically, he basically, I see someone's calling. No, thank you. You can call sometimes else. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyway, he asked me to get in the office. He wanted to sit down and talk to me. And he said to me, and he's also a Christian and elder in the church. He said, I want to compliment you for being a good example of a believer in the minds that you have shined the light that you have really been an example to everyone there, that everybody knew that you're walking with God and you, I have to compliment you and, and I want to pray for you when you go to your school of ministry that God will bless you. Little we know what we do and what we say has effect on those around us. Our behavior is determined by our relationship with God. Amen. Amen. And I'm, I'm, I'm definitely letting you know that when we face these crises, we are going to be tempted in our minds that we want to react in our flesh and get upset and angry even at times or get offended or disagree, you know. But in those times when you're being tempted, when that happens, you stop and realize, okay, the enemy's attacking me now, trying to get me upset over my situation, trying to get me angry. So what I need to do, I need to humble that very moment and begin to pray and say, God, I'm not going to let this situation affect me so I might get offended or get angry and I might say things that I should not say or have a reaction. So you go into your prayer closet, you humble yourself and deal with yourself in yielding to the love of God and, and bring that issue in your life before God so God can lift that thing off of you so that you will not be affected by the negative things that are taking place or someone that's trying to pick on you to try to get you upset. Amen. When you do that, then you conquered it and you slay the side and you can go and see that person face to face and have no issues in your heart towards them. Your heart is pure. So. Amen. Amen. So you maintain your relationship with God no matter what happens around you. Amen. If it's all possible, is to live with peace with everybody. Amen. If it's possible. I feel like there's times that some people will not take it, but at least we will be in peace in our hearts even if someone else is not. Amen. Amen. And that's the key matter. That's a matter of growing. It's a how God raises up to serve God. Hallelujah. And uh, many times we, we try to make a decision on what the outcome of circumstances are. Don't. Let God determine the outcome of every circumstance and let Him be in charge of it. 
Because we never know how things are going to turn out when God gets through working on the lives of others. At least when God does it, it always works. And if you commit someone into God's hands, leave it there and stop wrestling. The devil has the tendency to throw it back into our mind and try to remember someone did this and someone did that. When you get those thoughts, you cast it down and say, no, I'm putting that aside. I'm not going to defile myself. You know, I'm going to stay true to God. Exactly how Jesus was experiencing from the Gethsemane to the cross with all the negative thoughts and accusations and all these things and he refused to allow what others said and did to him even the Pharisees when he marched around in front of him and spat on him and said if you're the son of God come down from the cross and Jesus said not a word the only thing Jesus did say Father forgive them they don't know what they're doing even the ones that were condemning him to death, he was laying down his life dying for them. Amen. And when he died and he rose from the dead, you know, even the disciples, every one of them had failed when he had died on the cross. They all fled. Peter denied him three times. They were filled with fear and worry. They were afraid to walk out in the open, even to mention the name of Jesus. It wasn't until Jesus talked to them and ministered for 40 days and 40 nights before he went back into heaven, amen, and he told them to wait till you be endued with the Holy Spirit that came upon the Comforter. It wasn't until they were baptized in the Holy Ghost that they received the power of love and a sound mind to be able to have the anointing to conquer every circumstance that they faced and they were delivered from their fears because perfect love cast out all fear. But to notice this, none of those things would never have effect on the disciples unless they were willing to humble and say, God, help me. Peter had to say, God, Forgive me, I denied you three times. Why? Because he was afraid. Amen. Amen. He did not know he had fear in his life. Even though he thought he was strong. He didn't realize how weak he was. But notice on the day of Pentecost, when, when Jesus baptized G Peter with the Holy Ghost, he was the first one to preach. He was the first one to make a declaration that Jesus is risen from the dead. He was the first one to acknowledge that silver and gold have I none, but such I have I give unto you. And he commanded the man that was lame from his birth, rise up and begin to walk, jumping up and down with joy. Hallelujah. You see, we got to understand the whole purpose of giving our life to Jesus is to let Him live in us instead of us. His life is much more greater. His life is much more wonderful. And the more we live in His life, the more liberty and freedom we have in our lives. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I know this has been a different kind of message. Hallelujah. But I'm sure that every one of you that are watching on YouTube, you that are present here with us today, will have time to search your heart out. And also, don't just leave it there. Go to the altar. Go make an altar in your heart. And say to God, if there's any of these areas that you need God to make some changes in your life, just humble yourself. And say, God, you're right. I have more room to grow. Yes, God, I need more help today. I need to renew my heart today as I humble and pray. Amen. And if you do that willingly, God will honor your prayer this day. 
And, and as you humble and say, God, help me to overcome every obstacle in my life that I'm struggling with this day. And wash me, heal me, and cleanse me, and set me completely free. In Jesus' name, and I can now serve you with gladness and with peace and love. Hallelujah. And I shall overcome every circumstance I face. Because the change of overcoming something all happens in your heart. It's your heart that has to change. When your heart changes, everything changes. What really changes, you change. Because now you are free and liberty. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's, let's close with a song. We'll take up the offering at the same time. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Isn't God good? God is great. How wonderful is to know that Jesus loves us. Amen.
Praise the Lord. Well, God bless you, and we'll be back tonight at 6 o'clock, so you're all welcome to come. Hallelujah. And you get a chance to invite others to come as well. Hallelujah. Tell them that we have a great God and a big God, and we have an awesome church to grow in. Amen. Amen. So God bless you. Have an awesome day. Amen.